Hey, I'm Nick Boy, and welcome to Pocket for Thursday, the 31st of March. Today on the show, Gamergate, Armageddon, and Despair. This should be fun. All right, here's what's been making headlines. The first day of Microsoft's annual build conference kicked off overnight. The event is aimed towards software and web developers for Windows, but there's often plenty of juicy news for games too. This year, Phil Spencer eased nerves about the universal Windows platform by demonstrating that Steamworks and user-generated mods will be 100% compatible. The UWP will support G-Sync and FreeSync, and games will have consistent input support with controller and mouse and keyboard across all devices. Xbox One owners are finally able to turn their consoles into dev kits for free. This feature was announced back in 2013 and has obviously taken a little bit of time to implement. There's quite a process to getting the dev mode up and running, so Xbox One owners who want in are encouraged to visit Microsoft's developer site for details. Another big announcement for the racing scene was that all future Forza games will be on Xbox and PC. This kicks off with Forza 6 Apex, which is a free-to-play version of Forza 6, coming out before E3 this year. Apex will apparently be able to run at 60 frames per second in 4K on PC. The University of California in Irvine has announced a League of Legends scholarship. The move makes it the first public state-run school in America to support esports. The scholarship will earn students up to four years at the school and will be available to 10 students with new slots opening as the LOL scholars graduate. While a few private schools already have LOL scholarships, UC Irvine's newly appointed esports director Mark Deppie is certain more state schools will follow suit. Deppie said, I think we're going to be one of the schools that really encourages particularly public schools and shows them that this is a really viable thing. There's lots of interest in this, and it can improve your school and improve interest in your school. Damn straight, I would have finished my degree if UNSW had offered me an Emily is Away scholarship. A marketing survey for Bioware's Mass Effect Andromeda has been leaked, and with it comes some potential plot details. Spoilers. The survey asks about the effectiveness of a promotional blurb. Some choice details from the form are that players will lead the fight for a new home in hostile territory where we are the aliens, and experience the freedom to traverse and explore a planet-dense but seamless open world. EA Sports. Colonize everything. Phil Tippett, the man who failed Sam Neill and those kids in Jurassic Park, is making an augmented and virtual reality game. The veteran Hollywood artist famously designed the hollow chess pieces in Star Wars A New Hope, and we'd wager that's been a pretty big influence on the in-development hollow grid monster battle. Mr. Tippett, it's time for a new idea. Our final story is about Alison Rapp, who is, as of this morning, a former Nintendo employee. Rapp had the misfortune of being caught up in the rolling, amorphous, and hate-fueled cloud, which is bannered as Gamergate. Now, Rap's involvement with Gamergate is a giant, thorny, multi-pronged issue that is way too complicated to really go into here. But the source of most of her criticism is over an essay she wrote two years before she started at Nintendo when she was in university. That essay was called Speech We Hate, an argument for the cessation of international pressure on Japan to strengthen its anti-child pornography laws. It's pretty much a look at the cultural differences between Japan and the West, and whether or not the West really has the right to imperialize and tell Japan what to do. And it is talking about child pornography, so there are some confronting ideas in it. But she never comes out and says, I am in support of child pornography. That's something she certainly doesn't do. There's a difference between supporting something and sort of analyzing it. And that's something her university agreed with when they published it in their honors review. But of course, Gamergate took that essay as a full-throated defense of child sex and started bombarding Nintendo with bullshit about why she deserves to be fired. Now, Nintendo haven't come out and officially said why she was let go, and Rap also hasn't clarified the reason why she was fired, and we're certainly not going to speculate. I could see from Nintendo's point of view that it is a difficult issue to deal with when the word pedophile is written anywhere near the words Nintendo employee, but it it would be pretty spineless to fire her rather than deal with it using the context it deserves. So I guess the question we need to ask ourselves here is why? Why does Gamergate care about Alison Rapp? It's more than likely she's not a pedophile, so what's your problem? Is it that you're trying to protect children while bullying women to the point where they need to contact the police? Or do you hate her because she is a woman? 
because I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say it's the woman thing, because Gamergate hate women. And sure, there are some of you out there who still think Gamergate is about ethics in journalism, and I too wish that I lived in your naive fantasy world. And if you want to have that discussion, then we can have that discussion. But the fact is that the word Gamergate doesn't belong to you anymore, if it ever did. It's a hate group. And I know that some of you Gamergaters watch and you're gonna get all worked up in the comments of today's episode, but I really wish you didn't watch and just didn't bother. You're actively making the world a worse place. Please leave our nice corner of the internet. In fact, please just leave the internet. Good game doesn't want you here. Nintendo can probably do it without you. And Alison Rapp, sure as fuck, doesn't need you. All right, now it's time for Thing of the Day. In Worms Armageddon, General Tony made short work of an entire team of worms. The only problem was, it was his team. Watch this. And oh shh. I'm joined now by Goose for our talk through where you suggest a topic and we talk through it. Today's topic comes in from Nine Lives, who says, given the rise in popularity of games like XCOM 2 and Darkest Dungeon, what do you think makes people enjoy punishing themselves so much? Darkness, despair, and the constant threat of failure are the main theme of these games, yet everyone, myself included, can't get enough of it. Mother Goose, why do you hate yourself while playing games? It's fun to hate yourself while you play games, right? Though, because, well, not so much hate yourself, but it's fun to punish yourself in a game because it only heightens the satisfaction and the reward. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's as simple as that. It's the tougher the challenge, the more accomplished you feel when you overcome it. I think you experiencing Dark Souls 3 the other day, for yes. the first time, you are witness to how that feels. Yeah, yeah, mm. you are chasing that feeling of it was depressing for mm. most of the time, but then you feel like you actually did something. It, and it's escalation as well. Like you play a game that's easy and you overcome a challenge and you go, yeah, mm. cool. But at the same time, there's a little bit in the back of your head that says like, that was easy. Yeah. And then, you know, you bump the difficulty up and you go, yeah, this is feeling better. And, and games deal with difficulty in different ways. Mm. So sometimes bumping things up to hard doesn't give you that same sort of feeling. Yeah. But a game, like XCOM 2 or, or like Darkest Dungeon where it is a really well integrated part of the game. That difficulty is there, it's in every element of the game. Failure is, is designed into the game. Correct. It's not just that it's hard, it's like you're supposed to fail. And once you overcome that, yeah. you can't go back to the easy stuff. Interesting. That's yeah. the thing. It's like you're chasing a, a bigger high after that. You need harder games with bigger challenges and it, you just you can't go back to games where it's like, oh that was easy. No, you need, you need more. That is interesting. I do feel like games have evolved to not necessarily become easier, hmm. but I guess to become more forgiving, that there can be really difficult parts of games, but once you've gotten past that bit, hmm. save point. Uh, a moment where you go, you won't need to do that again. I think it's because games are now more designed to be finished. That yeah. it's like to get through a campaign and to finish a game, whereas before games were designed to just take your money in arcades and stuff. And so this is kind of a response to the idea that, no, you might never beat this game. This game is designed... And something like Darkest Dungeon is a game where I, I have not finished that game. And in fact... Can I, it be finished? I, 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 I actually <laughs> don't know. Also, I don't like returning to that world as much because I would say compared to XCOM or Dark Souls, Darkest Dungeon does have this thing where there is no happiness there. There yeah. is that that world is completely devoid of of hope and meaning and to the point where I go it it may be too much. Yeah. I, I need something to fight for other than just not dying. I think by comparison, something like Dark Souls has uh, wonderful uh, sort of world design, world building. Um, there are moments of triumph within mm. it. Where you're right, Darkest Dungeon is one of those games that you are only ever happy when you've got a few shit things to do. A few, with. Uh, just a few people who have gone insane from fear. Yeah, you're like, and, this is pretty good. And they're in, and there are other people in the asylum or yeah. drunk, and it's like, oh, oh I think, yeah, I'm kind of on top of it. Of how bad the game could be going, this is as good as bad as I can get it to be going right now. Totally. So, yeah, I, I think, you're right though, it is one of those things that, in a response to how easy games are getting, these this sort of subgenre of incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging, but at the same time incredibly rewarding games mm. are only looking better by comparison. 
And I think that despair, that sense of dread, that's also a bit of an adrenaline rush. Mm. And now that's being put in games that may not necessarily have that in the first place. So recently, Fallout 4 and Far Cry Primal mm. have both announced that they're adding survival modes. Far Cry Primal has like permadeath introduced. Right. And that's a game that's relatively simple the whole way through. But by adding that, you're extending the life of the game. But you're, you're now introducing an entire new sort of section of tension to a game that didn't have it before because yeah. every fight means something now. I, look, I, I would say that I'm a little hesitant to be excited about that because just adding, oh, you know what, you can't respawn anymore yeah. can feel like a developer just going, what's a quick way to add some replayability? And I guess that goes to your point that it's the game isn't designed for you to die to learn. Exactly. It's actually just you're making all the tigers harder to fight. And I'd be curious to hear any of those people playing Fallout with a permadeath mode, mm. once they do get, I don't know, 40 hours in and they die, do they go, well, I'll start again? Or do they just go, I'm done with that now forever? Now, can I ask, with, uh, because we've both played, you know, games like Darkest Dungeon, lots of roguelikes have this sort of element yep. to it. With XCOM, mm. do you play XCOM in Iron Man mode, where if someone dies, they're dead? Or are you, like me, if, if someone you have named and given pink hair to dies, then you restart that entire mission and make sure they get through. I reload too. Yeah. I have to. I'm, I, I still get to select the harder mode, but if there's a workaround, I'm definitely going to take it. Yeah, absolutely. Cheaters for life. Uh, let us know in the comments if you also cheat in these games, but more importantly, do you like these games that are filled with despair and dread and you're never really going to beat? You are getting off in a weird way right now. And I just want to play Dark Souls now thinking about it. Uh, that's it for today's episode. My Pocketeers, while you're on the internet talking about things that get guts off, uh, please check out Good Game on Facebook, YouTube, and iView. Want to meet fellow Pocketeers? Then join the Pocketeers Facebook group and Steam group. You can follow Good Game on Twitter at Good Game TV. Follow Pocket at Nick Boy, at Pierre, at GG, at Monkey, and at Sanamgi. <laughs> He's at Goose Mangus, and there are links to everything I just said in the description below. Today's Thing of the Day graphic was made by Oliver Potter. Thank you, Oliver. If you've made a thing, please send it in. And while we're speaking about sending things in, mm -hmm. I am doing an Ask Pocket tomorrow for Friday's episode. So if you have asks, please send them in, and I'll put them right here, right next to my heart. And I'll take them out, and I'll ignore most of them and answer about four of them. Until tomorrow, Nick Boy out. Goose out. Are you going back to Dark Souls 3? I am. Did you know, because I played it on PC here, I played it on PS4 at home, so I had to beat the boss again. I was like, oh no. But you knew now. I beat him on the second go. Yes! Halfway through his transformation. Ah, uh, see, it's easy now. Yeah. The whole game's easy after yeah, that. Yeah, that game's super easy. That's the hardest part, is my understanding. Yeah.